Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Oh, look, it's Nikki. Well, hello. Hi, look, Nikki. it's Pete Wright. Hi. It's good to Hi, see Pete, you. Hi, Pete Wright. Happy day. Happy day. Uh, we're, we're continuing our job series, and it's so delightful. And I have to tell you, and I can say this because our guest is here but muted and can't respond. Melissa posted this morning in our back channel that our guest today had listened to one of our previous job entries. And my first response was, oh, crap, we must have done something wrong. Like, and she's I canceling. Hope yes, she's <laughs> That's canceling. what I thought, too. <laughs> That's what I thought. She was like, I listened to it, and you guys are the worst. I'm done. <laughs> That is so funny because that's exactly what I saw. Because I just saw the the from Melissa, and then I saw Shell's name, and I'm like, yeah. oh no, uh, I don't even want to look. She's canceling. She doesn't. <laughs> she she doesn't want to be a part of it anymore. <laughs> oh, we're so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> the RSD right? is like, wow, off the charts. Okay. Well, anyway, she didn't cancel. And in fact, she's so nice. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to this conversation. Uh, before we jump into it, uh, you know the drill. Head over to TakeControlADHD.com. You can get to know us a little bit better. Listen to the show there on the website or subscribe wherever finer podcasts are served. You can join us on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest at Take Control ADHD. And y'all... Our Patreon community is the best. Now, of course, you can get into our, our the open public Discord server uh, by just visiting TakeControlADHD.com slash Discord. That, that will allow you to sign into the public channel. And our the general chat is really great, too. And there are, uh, there are some other public channels we put in there. But to really get to know what this community is all about, visit patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. You're going to sign in there. You're going to you're gonna start your program for a couple bucks a month and you will suddenly get access to the magic behind the scenes, pull back the velvet curtain, like it, the, the world is behind Patreon. You get early access to the podcast. You get members only access to the podcast. All the podcast episodes have extra content in them that is just for members only, a whole separate version of the show. And I should say, I know there are a lot of members who signed up and don't subscribe to their Patreon Patreon only podcast, please message me or Melissa, or and we will help you figure out how to use that Patreon version. Of the Don't podcast. message Nikki. Don't no. I did that was I didn't want to call you out. Nick, no, but. it's okay. I'm totally admitting to it. Don't message <laughs> me because <laughs> message I'll just Nikki. I'll just forward it over to Pete and Melissa. So absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Every now and again is a public service reminder that you you need to be there. But you could also access the live stream as we record. You could be in the chat room chatting along with us, asking direct questions to our guests. It's a really, really great experience. And, and you know, that plus all the other stuff that we do at the different tiers. I mean, we're trying to do so much to continue to build this community and, and make it a, a, just make it grow into an even better place every every day. So uh, patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast to learn more. Thank you so much to all of our supporting members of the show. OK, now we need to talk about jobs. My goodness, jobs. Shell Mendelssohn has built her 35-year career in education and career counseling. There are a lot of career counselors, though. What makes Shell indispensable for us today is that she has ADHD herself and has spent that career helping others make career choices that reflect joy and passion for their unique ADHD brains. Shell, welcome to the ADHD podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and have this conversation. I already had so much fun talking to you before, so. It's just going to get better. <laughs> It'll just get better. Okay. Well, but before we get to, I would love to get to our airing of grievances uh, to the point where you tell us, <laughs> you tell us everything we thought we might have done wrong in the in the last couple of shows. But really, I, I want to hear a little bit about you because I, I feel like when I think about career coaches, I think about, you know, I think about the the big like executive career counseling kind of things. I don't yeah. have a, a, a deep understanding of, of what of what the relationship with a career coach looks like. I'm curious how you found yourself in this role some 35 years ago, and especially how you found yourself really helping to focus on neurodiverse brains. Well, just to start out, thank you so much for that amazing intro. Um, I started out as a completely lost person in my 20s who I had a, you know, I got my teaching credential. It was back when 
uh, my mentor, Richard Bowles, who wrote What Colors Your Parachute? And you'll hear me talk about that quite a bit. But classic. He, I was trained by him. He was my mentor. Wow. And he, he says, oh, Shell, you were around when dinosaurs roamed the earth. You know? So I've been around for a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I guess how nice. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess it's nice and it's not nice. I, I always kind of have these mixed feelings whenever he said that. Yeah. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2017 and I miss yeah. him dearly. And uh, the whole uh, legacy, as you will, of uh, Parachute, I feel like I'm, I'm helping to keep that going. And that is my mission. Because it is a thing that my ADHD brain responded to in terms of career counseling and coaching. But just to take you back a little bit before that, I started out getting my master's in uh, vocational rehabilitation counseling. And I didn't even know what that was. I just knew I wanted to be in counseling and I wanted to be in a program with very few people. And I wanted to be in a program where counselors actually got jobs afterwards. And that was one mm -hmm. of the few counseling jobs that did. But I learned along the way that it was working with uh, it was career focused, helping people with disabilities who were in my, uh, in the workers comp industry, which is the industry I went into, uh, they could no longer can continue in those jobs. So we had to find a way to get them back into the, the market with their disabilities. So you kind of came into this, um, negative environment and they kind of entered the space with, they, a lot of them really liked their jobs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they felt it it was like a grieving period they were going through and because it's like part of their identity gets like ripped away it was ripped away it was yeah i yeah so i had my heart you know i had a lot of compassion for that but at the same time my mandate in this system was to help them discover what the next steps were and to help get them into something else so i work with a lot of people with different disabilities um including ADHD, but at the time I was far from being diagnosed, far from it. Uh, but I, I knew that at some point after 10 years of working in this field, I was just losing it. The system was getting to me. It was very adversarial. I was getting bored. And I was always one of these people, I think that's part of my ADHD brain wiring, uh, who started looking at things ahead of time, started thinking about what can I do next? Right. And that's right. when I yeah. I found uh, the training by Richard Bowles. I immediately stepped into that and it changed my life, my whole identity with what I did. So I stayed in the same field. And that's the thing I want to really mention is that I was always career focused throughout my career at Invoke Rehab. Mm -hmm. And I just continued on with that. And the general field I've always been in is education. So it's always about the thing that I enjoy doing the most is educating people on some level. And that takes many different mm -hmm. forms. And we can talk about that. Uh, but what people don't understand is when, when they think about education very often is being a teacher in a public school in a certain kind of setting. Mm -hmm. Well, I did that when I got my teaching credential and I hated it. I hated teaching high school kids. I hated uh, being in the public school system, being limited. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to do something that was still using those skills, but just not in that setting. So that's yeah. something that that's that's one of the things we can talk about a little bit is about how, thinking about you, how you use your skills that you really love to use and find ways to do that in different formats. OK, so when I got my training after I got my training with Bowles, I was still doing a little bit of voc rehab, but was easing out of it. Uh, then I had my son and everything changed. So, you know how it is. You have, it happens. You have yeah. a Can baby. You? Anyway. Yeah, life yeah. changes. Yeah. Can you give us a uh, a summary of what that book is about and, and that whole mythology around what colors your parachute? Yeah, what it is, is the thing that I, okay, let me step back and say that he is the OG, if you will, of career counseling. He mm -hmm. is the guy who started, who is the, everybody recognizes as being the grandfather of career counseling. So I used to go to these conferences and he would be always be the keynote speaker, right? Yeah. But there would always be 
some other people in the field who would come up and do like these uh, assessments versus parachute model, like taking all, you know, taking all the assessments where you check, blah, blah, blah. And I always knew that I hated that. I hated like that. The personality ones? The is that personal, what you're talking about? All that, that whole, uh, and a lot of career people do that. They still use a lot of assessments. Mm-hmm. It's not always the only thing they use. They always do the, hopefully do the follow-up to that. But the thing for me about assessments was it never was really asking you personally what was important to you. And often it didn't give you enough choices. And it always compared you with other people who were answering in a similar way, but did not enforce the idea of you taking a deeper dive and really yeah. looking into well, what is it, what it is, is it that I want? Okay. Mm-hmm. And I always felt like they were tricky me. Like there was always a trick to it. Like yeah. the, here is something, but it's worded a little bit differently. So I have to like now think about yeah. how did I say, what was my response to the other phrase? Yeah. yeah I, right, I, I get right. what you're saying. Well, it, and because the, to me, it's always been the game of it, when I take those assessments, is it trying to fit me to the job or the job to me? And I always want to fit the job to me. I want it right. to be, I want the Thank agency you. in that equation. <laughs> exactly. And mm-hmm. yeah. I like no assessment it, like distributed by an employer does that. They no. just don't care. Right. That's right. they no. don't care about me having that agency. No, I, I mean, we could talk a little bit about that as well. But however, so my uh, attraction to parachute when I finally went through it twice myself, And it all pointed to what I was doing. So it was very (laughs) confirming for me. It was like two times. Here we go. Right. I guess I'm supposed to be doing this. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, what it does is it does what our brains like to do, which is to break things down. And to ask very specific questions, uh, get you to not not ask questions, but get you to identify the things that are important to you. Sure. So it's kind of the opposite of of taking those assessments where you just check something. It's like, what is it that you are attracted to? What is it that you are energized by? What are the things that really are meaningful and have value to you? And if you take away all the scary parts about if I answer this way, does that mean I'm not going to get a job that pays me enough money? That's Mm -hmm. always the big question that people have. And I have to kind of guide them past that. So they can start really exploring what's out there instead of cutting themselves off at the knees, which is what mm-hmm. happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's called what Bowles calls a safekeeping self. We have to talk about that a lot. Uh, but safekeeping self. That's safekeeping self. And that can be used in almost anything that anytime you're making a decision is that part. That's that part of you. That's that little good angel, angel, bad angel, it's a bad angel, mm-hmm. right? It's the one that's going, ah, but what about this? And I can't do this. I won't do this. I shouldn't do this. What, but, 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 but kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's so interesting. Cause I yeah. have a, a couple of clients, one in, in particular that I'm thinking of who won't necessarily even apply or send the resume because they have that's already immediately ruled themselves out of the position. That's a good, yeah, I perfect I example. hear that. Mm-hmm. And I, you said like, it's the bad angel. And that implies that there's a good angel. And I imagine there are a lot of people listening to this who would say, <laughs> I don't think I've ever met my good angel. I didn't know there was one. Well, her name is Shell Mendelssohn. <laughs> oh, you Aww. have met her today. <laughs> Aww. Aww. But, you, but you know what I mean? Like those negative voices and that negative yeah. self-talk can be so loud that you yeah. can forget that there is, uh, that, that there's another voice. You can forget. Yeah. And this is what I work with. When I'm working with people, I work in a very small group of four to six people at a time. I can't do my brain won't do any more. Than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, this comes up throughout the whole process. Yeah. So this is where the testing sort of takes that out of it or the assessments take that part out of it because you're just saying, check, check. But still, you're wondering what's going to come out of this, right? So, mm-hmm. but if you're really going to get down into the weeds about who are you and what am I energized by? What am I really attracted to? What are the things that um, are going to sustain me over the long haul? What are those elements that I can bring into my work in some way? If I don't allow myself to just 
freeze somehow past that safekeeping self, mm-hmm. it's never you're never going to get the the true answers. It won't be authentic. And I tell people right off the bat, you are going to be battling with that, and I'm going to be helping you with that and reminding you at every step of the way to ask yourself if safekeeping self is entering the room, as I say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is it entering the room now? Yeah. And yeah. it does. Every time you ask answer questions in any aspect of what we do. So kind of going back to what you asked about how do how does parachute differ? It does break things down into all the different elements that are so important to us when we're making these huge decisions. And they're the things that very few people I I could probably a milla whatever percentage of micro percentage <laughs> yeah. of people on the planet actually take those steps and do that kind of work. But I'm really curious what some of those things are, particularly that ADHD folks tend not to think about. Like the things that make it really difficult for adults with ADHD to find not just a job, but a job that matches their identity, that they only realize they didn't think about X, Y, Z until after they got the job and were working in it for a while. Like what are the things that they naturally miss? Well, I'll go through all the, you know, I can give you all the little pieces that we, we cover. And the first one you talked about in that little intro to the jobs section that I listened to, you said skills are skills. Yeah. So identifying the skills that we, and the verb skills, the ing ones, like uh, planning, um, yeah. leading, organizing. coordinating, organizing, yeah. researching, all those things we all have a natural inclination to do and don't necessarily need training in. It's just Mm -hmm. part of who we are. But very often people go into jobs because they think that's the right thing to do. It's one that's going to make them the most, for whatever reason, people take jobs without considering what skills they truly enjoy using. And then with ADHD, they start realizing, they don't realize it all the time, but they realize something's off. It, because they're not using those skills. They're not mm-hmm. using. And so part of the process I do is to break it down into, and I'll continue on real quick and just say it real fast. Please, please. Skills, the people you want to work for and serve, the working conditions, which is a huge piece of it. The, what I call special knowledges or the things, the kinds of things you learned over the years that you really loved learning and the industries you're attracted to your base salary range that you need to just live like a human being and uh, the rewards and uh, benefits that you want that are the most important to you in your work. And I can go into a little bit of that. Then the uh, places to live, we have a section called places to live, which is more of a geographic, like geographically, what's going to support you to do all this? And if you have a partner, you do that exercise with a partner. It's a whole exercise. It doesn't mean you have to move. It's just knowledge, right? It's knowing knowledge. And then the last part is life purpose. And you've heard that term many times, but in the context of what we're doing, it's always that your biggest purpose is like your umbrella thing. It's like the thing that you're really here to do overall, but your work always, whatever work you do, if it's not aligned with that purpose, it's a mismatch. It's always Mm going to be a mismatch. So knowing what that is, is key and having a way to access that is what we do. Yeah. So so none of those things included the word ADHD. And this I find we we came up it was actually uh, Melissa as she was kind of collating a lot of the feedback from our survey who had the mm-hmm. observation that you know all of the deal breakers and red flags that people were coming up with over the last 2 weeks very few of them actually indicated ADHD like things that were these were to work like with values ADHD. discussions yeah. yeah these were all just much higher level and I note that you as somebody who specializes in ADHD none of those big categories involved specifically ADHD I'm curious how that plays in to your uh, sort of calculus when you're working with individuals with ADHD where where does the ADHD go oh man I spent 15 years tweaking this yeah. whole process for people with ADHD uh, and th- I'd say overall, it's 
I, I work with neurotypical people for years before I started work when I had my own diagnosis and I had that mm-hmm. very late in life. And I recognize, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one who's got all these issues going on. And I need to start working with people with ADHD. And once I started doing that, I didn't want to go back to, I just, I was having too much fun. Uh, So how does it, how does ADHD come into it? It's the way it's broken down. So the way I break things down is different for people with ADHD. And I've had to add and tweak the process quite a bit to make it palatable and to make it uh, so that it becomes easier to recognize yourself as an ADHD person and and to know that it's important um, to go through this process and especially things like working conditions because the way he has it laid out for working conditions isn't nearly as uh, detailed as it needs to be. Mm-hmm. It really needs to be very detailed. So we do almost like a little accommodations plan. I call it a self-accommodations plan within the process. So, so many things are tweaked for people with ADHD to understand and broken down. And I've developed a lot of docu- you know, graphics. I've tried to make it more graphic for people mm-hmm. so that when they're learning things, the instructions are graphic and instructions. You know what I'm saying? It's just yeah, it's more yeah. interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of elements to it that sort of help people move along in this process and really see it as being extraordinary for them, something that really helps build confidence. And the process is the same for everyone. It really is. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I've worked for, and pe- everybody needs to do this, not just people with ADHD for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. But the fun that I've had, it just helped me in, in my career to just get creative to get I it for personally it was just a creative endeavor to really start bringing that ADHD element into it like what would make it easier for me to digest mm-hmm. yeah well and i would think as a coach too th- what you're bringing to the table is you're questioning your client and getting them to see uh, and recognize what their skills are, what their strengths are and maybe seeing it in a different way than what they are used to putting the word to it. And what I mean by that is like, a lot of people might say, well, I'm not organized. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, what do you mean by that? What do you mean you're not organized? Mm -hmm. And then like really start kind of digging into it. And all of a sudden you might, you might see, well, you're a very creative thinker and you, you know, I mean, you can go down the road that still. You may not be organized when it comes to organizing your, your clothes, your office or certain things, but in, Boy, when it comes to maybe something like a creative endeavor, you name it, that you're, you're excited, there. you're excited yeah. about, you're going to organize like crazy. Absolutely. Yeah, right. well, that that gets to I think the uh, the the what we're seeing, which is like the reason the word ADHD doesn't come up in all of these things is because you're self selecting the the career path that works best for you already. Like I I personally would never say, God, just help me become an accountant. Yeah. Please, Shell, would you give me the guidance <laughs> that I need to become an accountant? Because that would be horribly self-defeating. Like there's no universe in which I, yeah. that would line up with my identity. So right. I, I think people with ADHD, and check me when I start lying, I think when with people with ADHD, it's easy to think about the meta sort of approach to the job hunt, which is I should be thinking about ADHD because that's who I am and lose track of the fact that if you just go through the job hunt, your ADHD will make itself known. Yeah. And I, I'm a firm believer that you don't have to disclose your ADHD to anybody. You just need to have a real understanding of the kind of work that fits you. Our brains are interest-based, are they not? Like Mm -hmm. we need to be interested. We need to be engaged. We need to be energized. Mm-hmm. And if we don't have certain elements happening for us, like I call it the wind beneath our wings, you right. know, the wind beneath our wings or the push from behind or whatever it is that inspires us and sustains us over a longer period of time. If that isn't there, then and we're in a job that maybe has five percent of that. You mm-hmm. you got to become familiar with what it you become familiar by going through this process with what the 
elements are that you need to take into consideration before you even apply for that job so you can have that conversation. And instead of saying, I have ADHD, how can you help me? You know, right. you would say, I, when, when I have the, under these conditions, when I have these conditions or however you want to put it, I am able to get up and move around, maybe give me some headsets so I, I don't, I can noise cancellation so I can really focus in on this stuff. Or you can say what, when these elements are present, you will have the best employee ever because it's mm -hmm. true. When we're tuned in and focused in on the work that we're doing because we like it, we generally enjoy it then it be we become the superstars. I want well, to, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, I want to really be clear to our listeners that what you're doing here is you're requesting the accommodations that you need without saying why you need them. Exactly. And yeah, it, and that's yeah. really important to advocate for yourself that it, yes. it, it it's okay to ask for those things, but you don't have to put it in this formal way of, I have ADHD and I need to have accommodations yeah. and this is what you need to do for me. It, it, it's a different conversation. Related question, though, that I feel like is important for those who in the past have said they have ADHD or advocate for themselves as somebody living with ADHD at work. Do you, in your experience, do you find that it is uh, it is like a necessary uh, good or ill? Like it, it can... It can it be damaging at work to do that more often than not, or or is it in a word? It can be. It, it can be. It can be. There is really no need if you're with the right, if you're in the right position, and you're how you're working for the right employer, and you're I in the right so. environment. Those things will naturally organically happen because you're aware of them and you can ask for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you need to know what they are. Yeah. And you need to in detail know what they are, not just I need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I mean, it needs we really drill down into the into the weeds of that. And it puts you in such a more powerful, if you will, position where you can confidently go in. And if you're in an interview and you say, for example, when when I have these conditions or when I'm able to blah, blah, blah. And the employer kind of rolls their eyes or doesn't answer or just kind of sighs or that's your cue to say, honestly, thank you for your time, but this is not going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciate your time, everything that you've, mm -hmm. you know, up to this point without burning a million bridges, but right, right. you really have to be able to say no to those because otherwise it's a big setup. And that's mm -hmm. what this, the, you know, really having kind of the roadmap of the, of, uh, the parachute roadmap basically gives gives you all the information you need to ask the right questions and to understand when you're in potentially entering a minefield again. Yeah, I really like this because, again, talking about that sort of meta approach to finding the fit, I, I know that about myself that I get I, I can get mired in the ADHD part and forget that if I'm if I go down one more level to the the more sort of core identity pieces, I can find a match with, I think it took me much too long to find a match to what I do and what I love and to let go of the things that I'm not good at because I was so focused on the practical application of accommodation to ADHD diagnosis and, and, and symptom. And had I just started with, here's what I'm really good at when I'm be at my best and do that, <laughs> it would have been, that would have been a different. And just know uh, how, you know, be able to articulate it. Uh, because re remember, you, you guys were talking about how do you describe the work that you do? Being able to mm -hmm. say, this is who I am. This is what is important to me in my work. This is what I'm doing. Uh, the, without having to say, I am a blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, but you have, in order to do that, you have to really have a clear understanding in detail of what those things are and mm -hmm. to work through it. It's not an easy, it's, it's not an, people who take this, take the steps to do this are brave as hell. They're brave people yeah. because mm -hmm. it's not an easy process. It's nuanced, but it's at the end of it comes so much more confidence. And instead of being a job, what I call a job beggar when you're going to apply for a job 
or if you're even trying to figure out what it is that you want to do for as an entrepreneur or self-employed or whatever, you've got to know what those those things are and be able mm-hmm. to articulate that. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. I, what do you, how do you coach people through who have, who have gotten themselves mired in the, I don't have a choice. I need something that pays the bills. Um, I don't argue with that. It's, I call it a means to an end job. And I always ask them, is it a means to an end? Like people ask me, I, first of all, when they work with me, we do like this eight week thing. And I say, uh, if you have something major that you're shifting into or like a job, that you're shifting into, if it's anything other than a means to an end job, this is not a good time for you to do this. Because I mean, the means to an end is what you need to make money and pay the bills. Mm-hmm. But there's also something to be learned about what would be the best means to an end fit. The things, mm-hmm. right. certainly the things that you don't want, that would probably get you fired right away Yeah, in a means to an end job. But you, there's there are element, certain elements that need to be there. So you you still can benefit, but it can't be. Uh, a, you don't want to come into this process with a, a feeling of desperation. I need money. I've got to get a job right now, uh, mm-hmm. I'm, it, like the job of my life. A means to an end, and you have some interviews set up to do that. That happens all the time. Yeah. You got to so pay the there- bills. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So if they're in that job and they kind of look at it as a temporary um, position, when would they be ready to do the eight week program? I think they can do it when they're in the uh, doing the means to an end thing, as long as they know that it is a means. It's not like the something they're the going to be in, but it's, that's not it. The okay. main thing is they need to be ready to really dive in, get committed and mm-hmm. take the full eight weeks. Don't drop off. Because right. you didn't do the homework. I always tell yeah. them that that's the time when you need to be here. Because I do coaching during that yeah. time. You get feedback from people. It's so important to get that support, right? From mm-hmm. other people who are going through this process. That's why I switched from just doing individual to start out with. I don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. The baseline for working with me is this process going through Small parachute. Yeah, yeah, because it takes you to, it gets you your roadmap. And then we, yeah. if you want to continue working with me after that, great. But that doesn't, they don't need to after that very often. They're just kind of off and running. They form their own little support with each other. And you know what? I'm good with that. Yay. Mm-hmm. I love mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. I want to see people form communities. I love the community yeah. thing. When people are speaking this language and they're really starting to understand and say to each other, hey, is that safekeeping self coming up for you? <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. they can start mm-hmm. coaching each other, right? There's something that you said on your website that that Melissa actually pulled out. And I think it's really interesting and on point to what we're talking about. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you'll enjoy it. Exactly. Absolutely. So when they talk about strengths, I say skills. Right. Like what skills do you want to use? Because when you can be have strengths in a, in a lot of different things, but mm-hmm. you may not love doing those things. And with our brain wiring, if we if we don't really enjoy doing those things and somebody says, oh, but you're so good at this, I'm just going to put you over here for a while. Well, I think about that with industry. Like I can see somebody saying, well, all I've ever done is ever worked in insurance. So I can't do anything else but insurance. Yeah. But you're saying, well, wait a minute. Let's look at the skills that you're doing in these jobs. Yes. Break Doesn't it mean you have to go into insurance. Transfer. You can literally take your top priority and we do a lot of prioritizing prioritizing so that you get your top list in everything that represents who you are and what's most important to you if you are going into something and you're not using that will not allow you to use those top skills for example it's not going to be a good fit uh so but if you have strengths in something, very often the skills that go along with that aren't even going to show up at the top. Like if you have strengths in doing things like insurance, but you don't want to be processing claims or doing administration or sitting behind a computer all day or doing, you know, all those little detail-y kinds of things. Uh, and I've had people, you know, a lot of people who it's really difficult for them to say, I'm, I'm an artist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm an artist. 
And guess what? There's a lot of ways that you can bring art into your work. It doesn't mean you have to be what society labels as an artist. And always said, poor artists or whatever comes along with starving artists starving right. artists yeah. that's starving it. artists yeah i mean there are different ways that you can bring that into it but if you don't that's where you pay the price if you don't even look at that if you put it on the shelf and say it's a hobby it's yeah, great if right. it's a hobby but you still are a creative person you still have this creative mind going on things always come and and creativity comes in many forms right Mm-hmm. It's not always just art, but people that are art oriented tend to be problem solvers. They tend to uh, like to break things down. You know, there's so many of the elements of creativity that aren't just art that those are things that you can bring into your work. It doesn't mean that it's, you know, it, it, it's that job title or the exact mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's a movie, I, I can't remember the quote, uh, or I can't remember the source of the quote, but I sort of internalized it and I use it on my wife all the time because I think she's very talented and she was stuck in a, in a place that did, wasn't very important. I kept telling her, always fail at the job you don't want uh, because it, that is the curse of failing up. <laughs> like she she was good at something she didn't like and they kept wanting to promote her to do more of it. Yeah. Like, You've got to be worse at that. But then Jim Carrey, I think, came back in his in his memoir and he said, you can absolutely fail at the stuff you don't want. So you might as well take more risks at trying to find the stuff you love. And I, I like that's that's he's better, right. right. He's right. <laughs> better. Yeah. yeah. A little bit I less to find that quote. I like that. Quote. I might put that on my website. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It's really good. Like you have an opportunity to take risks if you haven't if it's something that you haven't tried and you don't necessarily want it. Like it's yeah. That's great. And the thing that now it's just occurring to me, the thing that is that I wanted, the point I wanted to get across is that when you identify your top skills, which are the ing, verb kinds of things, sure. that you can apply those skills to in almost any industry. So if you're working in a field that bores the hell out of you, you're just bored yeah. in that field, but you've always been kind of attracted to this other field, you can take those skills and find work as a first step to mm-hmm. just go into that industry and be surrounded by people who are doing that, the, the stuff that they're speaking the language, they're even dressed the way you like to be dressed, they're, they're the kind of people you want to be around. And, you know, it, it's a first step towards transforming your, your situation, even right. though you're using those skills. Uh, and you could be using the ones that you don't love so much, even in the beginning. But being in that environment, a whole different environment, can be a game changer as a first step, right? It doesn't yeah. always mean making a 180. It right. can make making in, incremental shifts in the right direction. So I always say 65% of doing what you love is better than 5.01 or 5%. It, mm-hmm. it's a, there's a big difference. Mm-hmm. So. Right, right. So I have a question for you, something that comes up uh, more frequently than I'm sure my clients would like it to come up. Uh, (laughs) So there's been a couple of times where people have been put on different plans and because they need to do something more of right these like performance plans so they're they're on this verge of they might get fired don't get me started yeah (laughs) don't get me started yeah yeah so there's that and then there's also right the pip professional improvement plan yeah right and then there's also the people that actually do get let go of and now they're looking for something new like that's really all of the RSD that goes around that and low uh, self-esteem and just feeling so like that self-negative talk. I forgot already what you talked, what you said, the the good, the bad guy, (laughs) the bad coach. Safekeeping self. Yeah. Safekeeping self. Yeah. So loud, so loud. How do you, how do you work with, with people? And I'm not even going to say with someone, because I know a lot of people deal with it. Like it just is, well, generally at the beginning, I will often, not always, but often ask the question, how many of you have been in a PIP program? And mm-hmm. always at least one or two people will raise their hands. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when they're, uh, when people are in the middle of one, it's not always a great time to take the class because mm-hmm. there, being, there are too many conflicting things going on. Yeah. But what I can say about that is they're in the wrong job and they need to get the hell out. ASAP before they get fired because they're about to get fired. 
Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not it's not a plan to improve anything. It's a plan to get you fired. And I went and even mm-hmm. I even got the definition from the uh, HR website on what those uh, performance improvement plans were meant to do. And they're the complete opposite with everyone I've ever worked with who's been in them. And they they will. Yeah, the safekeeping self comes up in a really, really sad ways, in ways that are almost incomprehensible and make it really, really difficult to, uh, you know, work past that. I have, I will work with people as long as I understand that this is a job they want to get out of. And if they're willing to, to ask themselves, do I have enough money to sustain me while I go through this so I can get out of this? If anything, mm-hmm. I'll, I just want to like beat down their door and just drag them out of their job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's I appreciate a- your answer because I, yeah. I think it's a very honest answer. Yeah, it's what it's the truth, though, because I've been mm-hmm. working. I, I'll never forget working with this one woman who's an engineer and she was in the middle of, well, two people that come to mind, but every single week she would show up and her face would be, you know, it was mm-hmm. like. You could feel the the weight on her shoulders of what she was going through. And I just, my heart just, because I have like this compassion thing going on that a lot of us tend yeah. to have extra hormones or whatever it is, mm-hmm. compassion mm-hmm. hormones. It it made me so sad. And I, I saw how it kind of worked. It worked in the, worked out in the end, but I couldn't get her to leave that position during the, the, I really do push to just say, get out, just get out. It's not, you're not doing your, yes, it might, might be about the money. So you need to ask yourself, can you, how long can you sustain for a while? Or do you have a partner that can, you can work with or whatever, you know, but, and sometimes it's not always doable, Mm -hmm. realistic, but it is very difficult. And I don't say don't, I, I said don't do the class. It really depends on what stage they're in and if they're willing to to look at the idea of leaving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That has mm-hmm. to be there. And I'll say that. Are you willing to look at the idea of leaving? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially when you've, you've internalized that the place you are, however antagonistic it is to your well-being, is the safest feeling place at the time. Yeah, right? that's exactly. the, there's an emotional leap. Safe keeping self. You have to be, yeah, you have <laughs> to be able to take to just take that first step off the ledge. It is. It's, yeah. it's really difficult. It's scary as heck because, you know, a lot of times they've been indoctrinated to think there's something wrong with them or there's some they're they're the ones causing all the problems. And when the truth is, they're just in the wrong job. It's, yeah. it's just not the fit that they, they're meant to be in. And they not need the right to discover fit. what that is. But it's not you. You're just in the wrong job. It's so simple. So yeah. I would. So is that what you would say to somebody that's been let go to? Is that it, yes. it's just, it wasn't the right fit. It's not yes. the right job. So yes. we need to find you a better fit. Let's. Well, that's the whole. Pro- that. The whole process yeah. is to start to recognize who you are, and it's incremental, and it's. This is a nuanced process. It's like I said. It's not uh, always clear. Sometimes right. you have to put connections together. You have to look for repetition in information. You have to dig back into the things. And I, we talk about what did you love to do as a kid? You've heard that one. I have Mm -hmm. a whole exercise that we do around that, but that very often will inform you of the things that you'll come back to. If you gave up on them, you did something completely different because that's Mm -hmm. really the true essence of who you are. And it doesn't leave you throughout life. All That's those true. things we're attracted to as a kid, those don't, there's certain elements of that that just never leave. And it's discovering what those are. So you have to do, you know, I have different things that help them to start to recognize that and piece things together to get that aha kind of, oh yeah, mm-hmm. here it is again. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, it's coming up. And here's safekeeping self going, no, 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 right? Yeah. So it's, it is a process of, kind of clearing the way over time mm-hmm. that's you, there's no escape yeah. there's no escape <laughs> there's do no you escape. help in this program or maybe this is what they do after the program do you help them with the actual job hunting process like a- applying resume building interviewing all of that stuff 
I don't. That's not my forte. I would, uh, I would prob, I don't even end up referring people because very often the work that they do creates the map that they can ask all the right questions, know who to go to for the right jobs, uh, be able to interview, have the confidence, not go in, not go in as a job, what I call the job beggar, but more as a job Mm -hmm. developer for themselves. I love Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're, you're going in interviewing them. You're not going in you yes. Know, yeah. You were like, hey, are you the right fit for me? Yes. It's so true because yeah. I was telling my 17 year old daughter who's looking for a new job and she actually declined one of the places because she knew it wouldn't be a good fit. And I'm like, that's exactly right. You just keep doing that. Keep doing that. <laughs> keep do- <Yes. laughs> keep doing that. Yeah. Keep doing that. Job is a partnership, right? Yes. You're creating a partnership and both sides got to be able to give something in, yep. in order for both sides to get something out of it. That's why when you when you feel that confidence, you can walk in and if it's the wrong fit, you can say, thank you so much, but this just isn't the right fit for me. Yeah. You can tell the looks on their faces, the way they respond to things, the, even the way they enter, just the process of interviewing that they make you go through. Mm-hmm. Jumping yeah. through all these hoops, the questions that they ask, are they mm-hmm. relevant or not? Yeah. You can you can figure out, uh, hmm, you can start to ask yourself, how does this feel? This does not yeah. feel great. And when you when you go in as the job developer versus the job beggar, you are so competitive. You're top of the line to them. You're the ones that they want people who know what they want. They want people, employers, can you imagine being on the other side of the desk? Somebody walks in who know, who have, who can tick off all the, yeah, you, you know, you've got the background, you've got the experience, but they're desperate and they Mm -hmm. just want a job. And you can smell it. You can Mm -hmm. smell it. But then you Mm -hmm. have the person who comes in, picked you for a specific reason because this position ticks off your box, not theirs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you're trying to find out by having this personal meeting whether or not it's the right fit for you. And you can articulate all of these things that are important to you in the work that you do. And they're like, whoa, this person knows what they want. That's what I want. I want somebody who's clear about that. The right employer will respond in that way. Mm-hmm. So it's mm, the, the, the right people that you want to be working with that gets to that people portion of it. Um, so anyway, that's how how yeah. long do you work on, on average? I mean, you have this eight week program. Do you do you work with folks beyond that or by the time the end of the eight weeks, they're pretty much done? I work. Sometimes I do. Yeah. Uh, but generally, they're pretty much done. Yeah. <laughs> but I ask them to keep you know, in touch with me and let me know how things are going. And of course, Mm -hmm. give me a review, write those reviews Mm -hmm. for Google. Yeah, Google loves them. (laughs) That's good. So hungry. With people with ADHD, you got to just keep like, please, what, tell me about your experience. But the reviews, I'm very proud of the reviews I have on my um, website because they really do kind of tell a story. They're not just, oh, this was a great experience. They really go into detail and talk about where they were when they came in to where they came out. That's what I want. That's what gives Mm -hmm. me the energy to keep doing what I love is when I see that transformation. It's so, and it's not me. It's about the process. The process that they're going through will illuminate certain things for them. And then they'll start getting it and they'll start recognizing I've got, now I've got the tools. Now I, I, I can articulate it. Now I have the, the map in front of me. So anything that I'm looking at potentially doing, I can sift and sort. Sure. Yes, no, yes, no. Right. And just go to the things that kind of are exciting to go Mm -hmm. through. And then when you have that excitement going into an interview, how much of a difference does that make to how you, how that goes in general. What's your what's your assessment of the job market right now? Like we have all this about, oh, you should be able to find your passion and do your thing. But what yes. if, uh, there's a lot of kind of pervasive fear that that, you know, job access is deeply inconsistent right now. That's a tough one. to. I always say this process, you have to know what you want. Mm-hmm. You, you have to know what you want and that's going to make you more competitive. No matter what the job market is, no matter whether it's great or terrible, because it will take you through the terrible parts a lot easier than it will the people that are desperately trying to 
keep up and afraid of AI and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a that's a real thing, by the way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we we, we do kind of talk about that a little bit, but I always say try and make sure that you are a full, you know, you're this full person, this full package, so that the human part of you is more important than that, whatever that AI can create. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sure. yeah, because oh yeah. my gosh, haven't you heard some of those things with AI? You just know. That. Well, mm-hmm. I got I, just a yeah. brief story. Uh, yeah. Just this morning, uh, I watched a video from the Corridor Crew, and they are a visual effects house, and they found a tool that mm-hmm. allows you to take an actor with no green screen, no nothing. You have footage of an actor. Here's an actor literally drag a care a 3d character onto that actor and it replaces the actor with a 3d moving character it took about an hour to render out this guy had done the calculation and said you know what i made two years ago i made a short film with 200 shots that included a single cg character and that took three years to do and they ran the calculations and said had we used this new tool had that existed it would have taken eight days to do. That's and scary. <laughs> so, right, well, it's scary, except for I love the way they looked at it. They were like, yeah. okay, so now this is a challenge. Yeah. Can we make a good film in another eight days that is that has a cast of CG characters? What would that take? How much more can we do with the new tools? And I, I sort of like that. Like, this is a group that is saying, okay, I can't not use the tools. I can't remain competitive if I don't understand the tools. But man, I could create some really cool things with this kind of flexibility. And that, I think, is the sort of the the plasticity, right, that we need to approach these things with, not out of fear. Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that you, the person, it takes, they don't, it doesn't take them three years to develop a character or anything. They they can can go in and do it and do more and still be, because they're, they still need the human part of it to do that. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, they that's a great way of putting it. So those mm-hmm. that's a really good example, I think, of how it can be used for good. Yeah. And and you know what? I'm always going to be exploring that and I'm going to encourage everybody else to do that as well. Because it is a reality. It's coming and it's coming fast. So fast. Well, and it I gotta say, I also think it can be really helpful for people to build their resume. Yeah. Because all you have to do is, you know, what does, what does this person do? Or what, what, uh, these are my skills. How would I put this in a resume? And it, it's amazing what it comes up with. Mm. I wouldn't copy and paste it, but it gives you a starting point. So they have a starting point, but also know that I've seen people get work without a resume and where they say mm-hmm. the resume, they'll say, oh, by the way, we need your resume for our files. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. That's kind of where I go with the resume thing. Although yeah. when I say people do a resume, it needs, I like Yana Parker's model. I don't know if you've ever seen her, Yana mm-hmm. Parker, damn mm-hmm. good resume. She mm-hmm. did it years and years ago. The thing I like about it is that it, it really customizes whatever you're going for. Right. Uh, and it's not just a bunch of jobs that you've ever done, every job you've, it's yeah. the ones that just relate to what it is that you're going for that really make you stand out more as an expert in that area yeah, versus, like versus, uh, you know, being a generic, over, no generic, forget yeah. the generic, those go in the wastebasket. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And right. HR, right. their job is to just eliminate those resumes. Mm-hmm. 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 And they do it quickly because I was one of those fast. people. Yeah. I did it very quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the more, that's what I'm saying, the more you have, you're armed with the ability to articulate who you are and what you want, mm-hmm. what you're going for. What do I yeah. want? Ask people what they want. Nobody can answer that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when you go through a process that breaks it down, you can start to build that and be able to easily eventually answer that question. Sure. That's great. Yeah. Well, this has great been wonderful, Shell. I just as as we wrap up, where do you want people to go learn more about the work you're doing? So my website is careercoachingwithshell.com. It's also what colors your parachute.com. It's also passion to career.com. So whichever one <laughs> is the easiest, I have all those. You figure out who you are you and then see I am which URL with resonates Shell. with you <laughs> yeah. the most and pick that one. I just want people to get to my website. So I just found right. Yeah. And then Love it. 
Yeah. And so look for the master class, which is there's a little video on the front page and list, watch the video. And then it says learn more and click on that. It takes you right to the master class. So I, okay. I sent your uh, Melissa the link to that. Perfect. Can I also talk them. about the workbook I'm doing real quick? Yes. Workbook is coming. Sure. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. So I am in the process now of um, working with a publishing company to develop the first parachute inspired workbook for ADHD people. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And that's it inc- great. It inc- I've been working on, you know, everything, a lot of the things that people get in the class is going to be incorporated into it. Um, it's going to be spiral bound. So it lays flat. It's going to have tabs Mm -hmm. for easy. You know, I tried to think of all the easy access things. It's going to be in color. So it's going to cost more, but I don't care. It's got to be in color for our brains. Our brains need color. So that's all there is to it. Yeah. It's, I don't think there's going to ever be anything like it out there. At least I've been told. I want to see a trans. My goal is to see it translated into so many different languages and uh, for all those ADHD people globally that are out there, I'm sure when you are have you people. Expecting it, uh, August hopefully of this year. Yeah. Okay. Well, then you need it's to coming. come back on the show, and we Give need to, to talk about it. Yes, it's gonna. I, I mean, it's really. I'm just in the beginning of having them finally figure out how to do the designs the right way. I don't know mm-hmm. if you you guys have probably done books and work with. Trying to books are hard. They're hard. Oh my gosh, yeah. I've never books done this. Is the first time I've really gone through this process. So, but I'm having fun. I like it. It's fun. Yeah, it's just what you just got to sync up with these people. But once once we're synced, we're doing great. Anyway, well, the nice thing oh, is it ends. It's a project that has a reward at the end. Beginning, middle, and end. It's a mission. Yes. <laughs> it's a exactly. mission. Yeah. It's well, going to help sure a lot of people. You. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I think so. For I think sure. it will. Yeah. We sure uh, appreciate you coming and hanging out with us this morning and, and answering all our questions and uh, are, are just great thanks for your guidance and helping those uh, who are looking for finding their best fit at work. Thanks, Pete. Thank you, everybody else, for downloading and listening to the show. We appreciate your time and your attention. Don't forget, if you have something to contribute to the conversation, we're heading over to the Show Talk channel in our Discord server, and you can join us right there by becoming a supporting member at the deluxe level or better. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer and the great Shell Mendelssohn, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you right back here next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm-hmm.